So if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 17, 17. I wanna read one verse here, and then I'm gonna unpack a different verse and really get into the heart of the message, but I wanna set this up with this verse. The Bible says, a friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. So Father, I thank you so much for this third service of the day, and I pray you keep us safe in this moment as we go about our week. I thank you, Lord, for all the teams today, city kids, all that you're doing here. And I pray, God, that we would all lay down resistance, set aside distraction, lean in for a few moments and receive something from you. We give you our hearts and let us apply what we hear to our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. I love this verse, very simple, one line, but very profound. A friend, I would say a true friend, is always loyal. <clears throat> and a brother is born in the time of need. I think all of us have lived long enough in this room and online to have at least been in one moment where it was a time of need in our life. How many would say that's true? And here's good news. You're gonna have other times in your life where you're gonna come to a time of need. This is a positive message today, I promise. There's gonna be a time in your life where you're overwhelmed, you can't figure it out, you can't solve it. It's gonna be a surprise to you, and the Bible says that a brother is born for that moment to help us carry that load and move through to the other side in the time of need. This is very important, and I would say this probably for any moment in our life, but particularly in, in challenging moments, time of need, crisis, chaos, whatever, I would say there's a subtle attack from the devil, a temptation for you and I, and it's worked so many times, unfortunately, and that is when we're in those moments, he bombards us with the temptation to isolate. He presents isolation as an option to not face something, to just you know maybe embarrassment, shame, so many different things, and just kind of go away. And isolation is a trick and the devil is trying to isolate you and I away from people in the church, isolate us from the church, isolate us from right people, bring us to wrong people, isolate us from what God's doing, and when we're isolated, we're vulnerable. Please mark this down. It's easy to do right with right people. It's easy to do wrong with the wrong people. And so what the enemy wants to do is take moments of hardship and he presents isolation as an option. And too many people I've seen over the years cave into that. And they isolate, they quit in terms of church, they get away from the right people, they just go into the shadows, and that's a mistake. To counter that, what God wants to do is, as the devil seeks to isolate us, God is trying to insulate us into the body of Christ. Now, no church is perfect, no effort is perfect, because we're all imperfect, but, but there's safety in the flow of God. So I want you to please catch this today, that the enemy tries to isolate us, God is trying to insulate us, insulate us with the right people, with the community at large in a local church, uh, and we love you know, groups here at City, but, but to insulate us with a group of people that can help you and I overcome because all of us have come through a time of need and all of us will get to another time of need. And in that moment, will you and I isolate or will we insulate? Now, what's interesting about isolation, it's not really, I would say, God's idea. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 1, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. So isolation is not solitude. Solitude is getting a way to recharge. That's different. Isolation is cutting off right people, cutting off everybody altogether, and or getting attached to wrong people. That's a trick of the enemy, and God is wanting you and I today to, or to insulate and be a part of what God is doing and have support in the time of need. So I wanna encourage you today, if you're in a time of need right now, are you isolating or insulating? And the reason why this message is so important, I wanna transition here, is because everyone in this room and online, every one of us, me, all of us have a battle. And I promise this is a positive message today. Stay with me. All of us have a battle. And in many ways, as a human, we will have a battle the rest of our life. When you and I come to Jesus, certain things get broken off of us, and we never think about them again, and other things linger. Other things are tendencies, patterns, that if we don't go with God, we'll flare back up and we'll go back into it. Every one of us has a battle, maybe in an immediate situation or just 
a lifelong struggle. And the question is, how will you and I fight that battle? And, and so our battle could be today maybe food disorders, self-image you know, uh, disorders. Our battle could be anger, could be rage. Our battle could be addictive patterns, addicted to alcohol, addicted to narcotics, addicted to pornography, addicted to sexual acts that are wrong, addicted to whatever it is. Our battle could be jealousy. It could be, you know, you know gossiping, greed, uh, you know, all, you know uh, unforgiveness, you know, not forgiving our spouse. Who knows what it is? I think we all get the picture. All of us have a battle. And so my question is, what is your battle? And right now, in, inside of you, I would ask all of us to be honest and, and say, what is your battle? And you would answer that. And don't please say, well, with God, I can do all things. I don't have a battle. That's not true. Sometimes people come to Jesus and get saved, as we call it, and then get, like, weird. And don't do that. Like, like all, everyone has a battle because we're human. Now, we can overcome and win that battle in Jesus. But I'm asking you, what is your battle? And that you would be honest, and then the rest of this message have the context of whatever that battle is, you would overcome depression, anxiety, whatever it is that you can overcome through Jesus because a brother is born for adversity. So the question is, how do we win our battle? And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter four, this is the verse I wanna unpack as I preach with a little help from my friends. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12, the Bible says a person stand, notice the language, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So in this message here, the remaining time, I want to hit on three things that everyone needs in this equation. I call it the equation of victory. Here's the three things we need for you and I to overcome our battle. Whatever your answer is to the question I just asked, what's your battle? Every one of us needs these three things. I'm gonna drive it home because this verse said that a threefold cord is not easily broken. So the first thing that all of us need, no matter what the battle is, all of us need God. Everyone say God. One more time, everyone say God. Every one of us needs God. And it, it, it doesn't matter if you're a seasoned Christian or you don't know who Jesus is and you're struggling to find out who he is. Hear me, every one of us needs a fresh touch of God today. Not yesterday, right now, today. And I wanna encourage you, when God shows up in our life, we have the answer. When God is involved in our life, we have the inside track. We are the majority with God. We can be more than conquerors with God. We can do all things through Christ with God. Come on, we can do it with God. And when you and I, when you and I have God, we have a savior, a deliverer, a healer, a redeemer, a mender of our, of our hearts, a forgiver of our past, and, a, and, and the healer of uh, our present and the promise of our future. When you and I have God, we have a friend that sits closer than a brother. When we have God, he'll be everything we need and some. The old church said he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. Come on, when you have God on your side, when you have God on your side, you have enough to overcome. You would say, well, this is basic. I, I know it is, but I've done this long enough, served God long enough that even in myself, sometimes people don't solicit God until emergency time. And, 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 and let me say this. I've seen Jesus rescue people out of emergencies. And thank God for that. Jesus is an emergency Jesus. There's an old song in the, in the church, call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. He'll be right on time, call him up, right? So, so, so thank God for that. But, but I want to challenge us, let's not have Jesus be on emergency basis only. Let's have God be the anchor of our soul every day. Not to when our marriage is getting ready to fall apart, okay, God, now help me. And I'm not being speaking mean, I'm just saying, let's, that's, we can do it that way, but there's a better way. We can build our marriage on Jesus from the get-go, and we're not perfect, but we can begin to move forward. We can have God not be an emergency, but he can, he's the anchor of my soul that every day God is my life. He's my sustenance. He's my savior. He's my friend. He's walking with me. He's walking in me. He's around me. He's helping me. That God is more than a theory, and he's more than my grandmother's Jesus. He's my Jesus. He, he's a Monday morning Jesus. He's a Friday night Jesus. He's a Saturday morning Jesus. He's a Sunday Jesus. Do you hear what I, He's 
He's yeah. Jesus. And so for you and I to overcome the battle of our lives, now my battle, my two big battles, I've had a lot of battles, my two big battles is fear and anger. And, I, and, that, and, that, and, and these two things have been massive in my life. And I'm preaching to myself because what I'm sharing today, I've actually practiced in my life and I've been better for it in seeing God do miracles in me. And so those are two battles that I've overcome and there's no way I would have overcome fear and anger without God. I had to have God show up and me invite God into my mess and begin to straighten me out. How about you? <laughs> Amen, God. And so what's amazing is, is that God, I, I just feel this, God is not embarrassed of your battle. And some of us are embarrassed of our own battle. Some of us are ashamed. Some of us are not wanting to tell anybody because we're embarrassed. God's not in embarrassment. That's our reaction, and maybe rightfully so, but God's not moving like that. God's not embarrassed of us. He's running to us. And God will heal us of our conditions. And when God is in the equation, things can begin to change. So it doesn't matter what our battle is, because every one of us has it. It doesn't matter. And it's okay to have a battle. Like, no, I shouldn't have a battle. I should be strong. No, the truth is we're, we're weak. We're human. We're frail. And it's okay to have a battle. The question is, is when I'm in a battle, when I'm facing that, and when I'm honest with myself, how am I fighting? And we fight with God. God's number one. If I have God, I have what I need. We start with God. Now, if you don't know Jesus today, if you haven't said, Jesus, save me, I would, add, I would invite you to do that today. If you have done that and you've drifted far from God, I pray that you would receive Jesus and come back to him because that's the first step. You and I, when we have God, we can overcome. And folks, God, he can break off alcoholism. God can heal us of trauma. God can fix, he can fix our marriage. God can change the trajectory of our family tree. God can heal us of the greatest wounds and the smallest wounds. God can break off any habit, any pattern, anything that has scarred us, God can redeem it. I'm telling you, and God did not, hear me, God did not cause our wounds, but he heals our wounds. He didn't cause our trouble. He gets us out of trouble. God didn't cause our trauma, but he delivers us out of it and sets us free. And just real quick, when Jesus was raised from the dead and he appeared to the disciples, Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, he said, I'm not gonna believe until I see the scars and put my hands in the wounds. And so Jesus, after the resurrection, his resurrected body, Jesus still had wounds. And Thomas saw the wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side, and the Bible says in John 20 that Thomas believed because he saw the wounds. I want you to hear me. This is important. When Jesus comes into our life, there's, all of us have wounds. All, all of us have something. But here's the amazing thing. Jesus doesn't erase the scar. He takes the pain out of the scar, and he puts his healing in the scar, then when people see your scar, that's when you say, this is what God did in my life. He brought me out of this thing. This scar should have killed me, but I still have a voice. This thing should have taken me out and caused me to lose my faith, but I still believe in a God and I serve him. Come on, give Jesus praise real quick. Hallelujah. With, with, with a little help, from my friends, how do we fight the battle? The Bible says a brother's born for a time of need. So here's the equation. Everyone say God. But it doesn't stop with God. It's God plus you. Everyone say you. The equation, the two out of the three, is God plus you. You and I have to show up. We have to show up because in this verse, in Ecclesiastes 4, a person can stand alone and be attacked and defeated. Notice that in Jesus, it's possible to be defeated. I want everyone to look at me and, and, and just please receive. It's possible to serve Jesus and be defeated. That's what this verse just said. And over the years, I've seen people, now not defeated for eternity, but defeated in that temporal battle. Like I've seen people you know, give up or, or, or just do what the enemy said and, 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 they, and they miss out on their moment. So this, and there's other verses that would bear that out. But today I'm focusing on this one. But he said two can stand back to back and conquer and three are better. So we see an equation here of three things. It's God plus you. Everyone say you. Now you and I have to show up and fight the battle. God's wanting to use you and I. And hear me, I'm not preaching that we do it. God, God uses people to do his will. And so God wants to give us victory, but, but I don't believe in a theology here 
that we just sit down on a chair and say, God, if you wanna do it, you do it. Whatever you wanna do, I'll let you do it. I'll just wait on you to do it. God, whatever you wanna do, you can do it. When you wanna do it, how you wanna do it, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna let you do everything. Let's take that same idea and put it into marriage. What if a couple has trouble and they say, you know, God, I'm ready for you to heal my marriage. And God says, sir, love your wife better. Oh, no, God, you do that. And then he says, today, I want you to go tell your wife you're sorry. No, Lord, I can't do that. She didn't tell me sorry. Lord, you do it. I'm talking good right now. Amen. <laughs> you with me? Uh, uh, Lord, uh, I need you to tell her to do what I want her to do. And God says, I want you to serve her. No, Lord, she won't even clean the dishes for me. I'm not gonna do that. You do it, God. And that's, it's facetious and funny, but it's ridiculous. Yeah. That's not how it works. How does God do it? God changes a marriage when he gets a person, two people to be engaged, and that husband steps up and, and, and he loves his wife. That husband apologizes when he needs to. That husband begins to serve his wife. That husband begins to love his wife and care for his wife. He doesn't use the verse the Bible says for you to submit to me, woman, and submit to me. Like, that's gonna work, you know? <laughs> Not in that attitude. And so we come, and, and so God is, my point is that in a marriage, God is not gonna come down and do it. God's using people's willingness to step out, and when they do that, healing and unity and restoration come. This is the way God set it up all the way back from Abraham all the way till now, is that God uses men and women that say, yes, God, I'll be available, I'll show up, and Lord, I'll say yes to you, use me for your glory. And some of us today are thinking, I have nothing to give, and I understand it. But even in our weakness, God can turn it into a strength. And the Apostle Paul said, I will glory in my weakness, that the power of God rest on me. So even if we have no strength to give, our weakness is enough for God to use and come through in our life. So the equation of the battle, all of us have a battle, whatever battle it is, and I pray that at City, you would have the comfortability to admit your battle and not pretend in a spiritual mumbo jumbo, but, but be honest. And it's God plus you. And you and I say, you know what? I'm gonna join this fight and I'm gonna resist this temptation. I choose to resist this habit, this pattern, this, this thing. I'm choosing to resist it. You know, the Bible says in James, submit to God, resist the devil, then he will flee from you. Draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Notice God put it on us to resist the devil and the devil leaves us. And so you and I have a part to play. And so you and I, but, but, but I wanna say this, and I've done this, I've, I've done this a thousand times, and maybe you have too, but this is a trick. I think it's a trick. When you and I are facing a battle, you and I can ask a logical question and we can ask it this way, why? Why am I facing this? Why did my dad do that? Why did my mom do this? Why is my family tree full of people like this? Why, what did I do wrong? Why am I dealing with depression and anxiety? Why do I have to deal with this and other, and, and other people don't have anything? Why am I struggling to find the mate that God wants from me? Some of us think this way. Sister Crazy Pants over here is wild, and you gave her a husband, and I'm living, and I'm not crazy, and, you, and I don't have a husband. What's going on, God? Don't look over there at her. I'm, I'm look at me. <laughs> or some of us say, oh, over here is Crazy Jack, and Crazy Jack got all the things he ever wanted, and, he, and Lord knows he has a secret problem. I don't have any problem. Why don't you, and why haven't you blessed me? That's just real talk, isn't it? Yeah. And we've all thought that before. Don't look to your neighbor, look at me right now because somebody's gonna get offended. But I'm just saying, all, all of us have had thoughts like that. Like, why am I dealing with this? Why don't I, why can't you set me free? And that's a logical question. I've asked God a thousand times. Why in God's name have I dealt with the things I've dealt with? The problem with that question, it paralyzes us. And there's no answer that we could get from God or a trusted person that will satisfy what we're really asking. There's nothing, there, we're never gonna get an answer. So if we live in why, we won't move forward and show up on the battlefield and say, God, use me. Instead, we'll be paralyzed with God and then the why leads into frustration, greater disappointment, anger toward God, maybe resistance toward God, um, stop believing in God, stop having living faith, 
because we're worked up, rightfully so, with what we've gone through, but we're stuck with why. And here's my encouragement. I've done this too, but I've now said, I didn't choose the battle that came to me. Trouble in kindergarten, had a hard time talking, molested as a kid, had a hard time in school, basketball helped me, You've heard my story. I got into a little of addiction. God set me free. And to this date, 35 people in my life have died premature death, including my cousin and hearing my best friend die on the phone. So I have to ask myself, why in the world does this happen to me? Have you been there? I've done that. I've been stuck. But then I said, I didn't choose that. If I would have, in my right mind, I wouldn't have chose this battle for me. This battle chose me. Therefore, I'm gonna step up and, and, and step to the plate with God. I'm not gonna let this battle dictate what I do. I'm gonna stand up in Jesus and say, I'm gonna win this thing. I'm gonna overcome this thing, and I am gonna live in freedom. And when I die, I'm gonna die as a man of victory, not a man of defeat. And so I wanna encourage you, show up and say, God, use me. This battle was, God did not tempt you with this battle. That's the devil. The devil tried to take me out, but God had a plan to keep me in. And the devil tried to take you out, but you're standing here right now. And let's not get mad at God, but say, God, here I am. I didn't choose it, but I'm going to defeat this thing. This battle will not defeat me. I will defeat the battle facing me. Come on. If you believe that, give God praise. I'm talking about an attitude. I want to ask you again, what's your battle? What's your battle? What's your battle? I, I'm going to tell a story. This is about a mindset with God. This past week, after me and the boys watched the Olympics, we watched the men's basketball team win the gold medal. Steph Curry did an amazing job that last game. We were hype about it. I just was interested. I like watching sports stuff. And this past week, I watched Kobe. When he came on the dream team in 2004, the men lost the gold medal. 2006, we lost the world championships. By 2008, they needed help. And so at that time, Kobe was the MVP. He was the best. And they asked Kobe to play in the Olympics for the first time. And he said, okay. And uh, they, they got to Vegas. Um, that's where they trained for about a month before the Olympics start. We're putting guys together, trying to get them to gel and, and then, of course, win the gold medal. So in Vegas, they're there. LeBron's telling the story. And he said, all, tw all 11, there's 12 players, 11 of them go out one night, all night long. They get to Vegas, they all go out in a club. They're out all night long except Kobe. He doesn't go with them. They're, all, they're out all night doing whatever they're doing. They get back to the hotel at four in the morning. They haven't slept. When they get into the lobby, Kobe's in the lobby with his gym suit on. He has his duffel bag and he has gloves for weightlifting. And they're like, Co, what are you doing? He's like, man, I'm ready to work out. What are you doing? Uh, 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 uh. And he said, you jokers have lost the gold medal and I'm here to win it. I'm tired of losing it. They all get on the elevator and they're talking to each other. They're nervous, like, man, I can't believe Kobe, man. He's, yeah. And Carmelo said, I'm not getting up this way. I'm never doing that. Well, the next day, LeBron and D. Wade joined Kobe at four in the morning. As the week goes on, all of them begin to join, including by the end of the week, Carmelo even joins them. And they're all lifting weights at 4.30 in the morning moving into this direction, and Kobe galvanized that group, and he said, I'm not jacking around. I'm here to win a gold medal. We're not going out anymore. We're doing this right now. He gripped that team, and they all followed his example, and they won the gold. Now, I wonder if you and I would have that same mentality in our faith. I'm not jacking around. I'm not playing games. I'm not going to make the excuses. I'm in, locked in with Jesus, and I'm going to win this thing for God. I'm gonna defeat the battle against me. My marriage is gonna make it. My life is gonna count. I'm gonna come out of this battle. I'm gonna come out of this thing, and I'm gonna win because God's on my side. And I have a part to play. My mentality, my mentality with God has a part to play in this. Don't sit back and say, oh, I don't know. I just want God to do it. No, God, use me. I'm, I'm here. God, I'm yours. If you want me to forgive, I'll forgive. I'll say sorry. I'll serve. I'll love. I'll give. I'll obey. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. 
So it's God, everyone say God, plus you. Here's the last thing, it's the right people. Notice in our verse, he said that two can stand back to back and, and, and overcome, but three will be defeated. The equation of victory, in our, this is so basic, guys. I'm not trying to wow you with revelation, but, but this is so basic, but it's so challenging. God plus you, plus the right people, helps you and I overcome whatever battle, anytime, anywhere that we're facing. But this part is probably the most, you know, I would say God is a challenge at times to be the anchor of our life, ourselves showing up as a challenge. In my experience, I think the third part, this is the biggest challenge of this message. In our culture in America, we are based on individualism. My friends in Africa, my friends in Asia, my friends in South America, they're community-based. Like they have mom, dad, uncles, and aunts live with them for a long time. In America, at 18, we want you to leave. And all the parents said, amen. And, and I love my mom and dad, and, and, and they're great, but I'm glad they have their own house. And they're glad they have their own house. And I'm glad you have your own house too. I'm glad we're not in a commune. Aren't you glad we're not in a commune? Come on, somebody, everyone go home. <laughs> see you next Sunday, amen. I'll see you at group, then see you Sunday. But this challenges us because we tend not to grab to community, we grab to isolation and individualism. In our, in, in our faith, I'm not here to challenge, that's what our culture does. I'm not here to challenge that. I'm just saying, but in our faith, that's really not how God works. God works in community. We see that in Scripture, Old Testament and in New Testament, and we, we struggle because at times we deal with pride, we're embarrassed, we've got shame, we want to present a strong front that people think we're strong, and we have a hard time calling somebody and saying, help, I'm drowning. My marriage is on the brink of ending. I can't parent my child if I try. Can you help me? I'm secretly on drugs. No one would know it. I smoke weed every day. I'm getting drunk every day. I need someone to help me. My sexual appetite's out of control and no one knows that, God, I need you. And then call somebody else. This is why this is a challenge to do, but when we do it and we invite people into our world, you and I, it's the third piece of how you and I overcome the battle. And you and I invite people in. There's something about it. The Bible says in James 5, confess your faults one to another and you will be healed. Great pastor in California, Rick Warren, coined this statement. He said, to be forgiven of our sins, we confess them to God. To be healed of our sins, there is a place where we confess to one another. We don't like that verse. But that's what the Bible says. James 5, 14 through 16. And I wanna encourage you that you and I would open up our heart and do what God says to do because everyone in this room and online is facing something now. And how we face it is up to us. How we navigate it is up to us. And you can be alone and fight and be defeated or you can be with two, stand back to back and overcome or even three is better. God, you, God plus you plus the right people I believe that's the equation that equals victory. It may not happen right away, but it's gonna give you victory. And here's why this is so important. Because you and I can have a personal battle and, and, and we're not controlling it, and we're not in control, and we can ask God to forgive us a million times, and he will. Because the Bible says in 1 John, confess your sin. If you, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. Thank God for that. We can be forgiven of our sin. And we can be in a battle by ourselves with God and say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And he will every time. He will. He understands, man. Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands what we're going through. And he gives us grace and mercy in time of need, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. So you and I have grace and mercy. But I would challenge you, being forgiven by God is not the issue. The issue is, is that battle being defeated? And we can sit here the rest of our life and go in a circle and say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, I'm yelling again. I'm getting mad again. I'm doing wrong again. And just, zoo, 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 zoo. And just go around and around and around and around and around. And, and I'm not saying you're lost. I'm saying you can be saved and have that battle and go to heaven. But you don't have to live in that constant chaos. You can live in victory. And if we're honest, we can't solve it by ourselves. If we could, we already would. 
That's why we have to be real and say, God, I need you. Then I have to step up. Then I got to find some right people to come around me and help me overcome this thing and be honest and be accountable and say, man, whatever the battle is, here's my issue. Here's what's going on. And you know what? I need you to call me on Friday night. I need you to call me on Monday morning. I need you to check up on me and say, how are you doing? And I'm going to be honest with you. And when you have accountability, that's when habits are broken. That's when patterns change. That's when things begin to move. And God forgives you. And God sets you free from the battle. I know this is good preaching. Come on. This is right. This is in the Bible. But this, but this, but this, 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 ah, uh, uh, we don't like it. In fact, when you and I are tempted to do wrong, when we're tempted to be in the pattern, when we're tempted to be in the battle, here's what we do. Man, I feel tempted to lust. Man, I'm tempted to get high. I'm tempted to hate. I'm tempted to forgive. I'm tempted to quit church. I'm tempted to do this. I'm tempted, man, I'm tempted. Here's what we do. I'm tempted. I'm tempted. And I hide in the dark. And I may have, Lord, please help me, but Lord knows what's gonna, we all know what's gonna happen. We're gonna do it. Hiding in the dark. That's our propensity as humans. That's not what we do in Jesus. I come out of the dark and I come in the light and I say, God, I'm being tempted right now. You know what's up? God, I'm being tempted right now and I can't overcome. Furthermore, I'm gonna call my friend. I'm gonna say, Pastor Chad, I'm overwhelmed. Can you help me right now? And when we just do what the Bible says, we can have what the Bible says we can have. And you and I have to make a decision in this big area of our life, whatever battle it is. God plus you plus the right people equals victory. Um, just a couple more minutes. You say, well, where's that in the Bible? I'm gonna give you three examples real quick. David, in his old age, fought a giant that was actually a cousin to a Goliath. And the Bible says he was overcome by that giant and it took David's nephew, Abishai, to come and kill the giant. Notice when David was younger, he had the strength to kill the giant, but as he was older, he needed help to kill the next giant. Notice that. Number two, there's a great man of God named Moses, probably the closest man to God in the Old Testament outside of Enoch that we know of. And Moses is leading the people into battle. He's on the mountain and they're fighting a battle. And as, and as long as his hands were raised, they overcame. But as men, as as his hands came down, they lost, which shows us that God does care about our physical posture, by the way. That does matter. And so Moses needed help, so he had Aaron and Ur get a stone. He sits down, and they hold his arms up, and as long as it took, and because they held his arms up, God's people won the battle. The great man of God, Moses, needed help in that battle. The last point is Paul. Paul gets saved. He gets changed. He's preaching. He's He's leading people to Jesus. They have a plot against his life. And, they, and we don't even know who these guys are, but in Acts chapter nine, the Bible says disciples put Paul in the basket, lowered him down, and let him run for his life. And we have two-thirds of the New Testament written by him, and he changed the world among the other apostles because of his faith. But it would have never happened if the guys didn't let him down the wall. In this room right now, and online, there's people that are watching, and man, we're, 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 we're not, our marriage is in trouble. Our private life isn't good. Our mental health is struggling. Our financial spending is not in order. We are not doing, and that's okay, because guess what? We're human. On, on, on last Monday, I got in an argument with Summer. It was her fault, of course it was. I mean, no, it was my fault, because I was tired, and agitated, and I needed a break. And so I argued with her, and I have to make it right. I have to apologize. Look, man, stuff comes our way every day, big and small. It's okay. I mean, we're human. I'm not up here as a superman for God. No, I'm real. I need Jesus just like you, man. And God helps us along the way. And when you and I do God plus you, in fact, do it with me. Everyone say God, God. plus you plus the right people equals victory. Now, this is why, in closing, this is why we do groups. I'm not here to press you to do groups. I'm inviting you to learn about groups, investigate it, pray about it, and if you feel led to join. At some point in your faith, I think it is important that you leave a row and join a circle and you get in community. Groups help this big church become real small. About 12 people, some groups are larger, but even in the larger groups, they break off into smaller groups. 
We just believe that this, there's something about this that pre, groups provide what I'm preaching right now. It, it just provides it for you. Now, you can take advantage of it or not. You can have relationships here outside of groups, of course, but groups help facilitate it. So I'm gonna encourage you to think about joining a group. As you leave today, you're gonna grab one of these sheets of paper, you're gonna pass it out, please take it, and this just lists all the groups, all the days, all the categories, what's going on, and you can pray about it, you can sign up online or on the app, the website or the app, and you can just, or today, ask questions. People out, the people outside, you can ask questions to them, but I wanna encourage you, and I'm gonna read off the categories, and then I'll be done, but there's women's groups, men's groups, marriage and family groups, growth group. These are categories. The growth groups are any Bible study. So if you want to have a Bible study, go to the growth category. Uh, the youth groups that we have. Um, the care groups. The care groups would be the divorce care, uh, gr a grief share. It would be um, men's groups for trauma, women's groups for trauma. It would be those that have gone through an abortion. We have a post-abortive group to help women and walk alongside them. Uh, women dealing with infertility. So all these groups are under the care category. Uh, and then we have interest groups. So those would be like going on hikes, and going, on you're going to restaurants and eating. Um, if you like shooting guns, we're gonna have a gun group that blows stuff up. We don't have that group yet, but if you wanna lead that group, you can go outside and say, Pastor Ronnie, or he's not a pastor yet, but Ronnie, I wanna lead a gun group and blow stuff up. We'll do that group in safety, amen. But that's, that's like interest groups. Uh, young adult groups, we have outreach groups, and then our recovery groups meet on Monday night. Amen, thank you. You can do this. God plus you plus the right people equals victory. And there's a story that I wanna end, and it's a girl in our church, a young lady named Taylor Casper, who said I could share her story, and this is a summation of it in a real quick form. When she was one, her mom was in an accident, paralyzed, her father was a heroin addict. She, as a young child, had to become her mother's caregiver, got addicted to drugs quick, got pregnant very young, dropped out of high school, roller coaster of addiction, roller coaster of family trouble, roller coaster of different things was assaulted, different things happened to her that were not good, and that, you know, I would say, put her back. She gets married, she's struggling with addiction and, and the navigation of what she's dealing with in her battle. My mom and I met her about two or three years ago at a restaurant she was working at, invited her to church, didn't know her or her story, of course. Didn't come right away, but this is why it's a power of an invite. But later, uh, met a, a member of our church and came to City, and then she and her husband joined a group, and they began to get uh, support and get you know, surrounded by a different group, and she, uh, and she began to be sober. And then she received prayer at a special service by one of our pastors, and she said that when he prayed for her, something broke off of her life and something left her, something was different, and something changed. Isn't that powerful? This is the power of the gospel. And today, today she's walking out her healing. She's a you know, walking billboard. She'll tell you about her story. It, yes, there she is right there. And uh, give it up for Taylor. And here's, here's the best part. She's been sober 293 days. Come on, somebody. That's the power of God. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. If God can do it for her, God can do it for you. Whatever your battle is, God plus you plus the right people equals victory. One more time. God plus you plus the right people equal victory. Come on. Let's bow our heads and bow our hearts, please. God's no respecter of person. God can do something for you. If you don't know Jesus today, you've never received Jesus. Today is your day to receive him and or if you have, but you've drifted from him, it's your moment to come back to him. And you would say, we have you bow your head. We're not here to embarrass you, but we are here to help you move forward in your faith and say yes to God. And you would say, yes, PD, that's me. I need to receive Christ for the first time and or I need to recommit my life and get right with God today. I need this today. If that's you right now, go ahead and raise your hand to heaven. I wanna pray for you to receive Jesus. Thank you, God bless you. Excellent, excellent, good, excellent. Thank you, excellent. Come on, give them a hand for raising their hand. Thank you, good, good, thank you, thank you, good, excellent. So great, thank you for trusting us to come to Jesus. And then you would say, Pastor Dave, I know my battle, and maybe one of the three or all three are, you know, maybe God's there, but maybe you're having a hard time showing up, or maybe you are showing up, but, the, but you're not opening up to the right people, and you, you know you have, it's God plus you plus the right people. This is the equation that gives victory. And you would say, I need help, Pastor Dave. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. Practice this out. 
and, a, and move in overcoming my battle. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. I want to pray for you all over this room. Thank you. Hands up all over. Good. Raise your hand high. It's good. We're here to support you. Let's respond to the Lord today. Follow me in this prayer and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything that's wrong in my life. I turn from that. I say yes to you. I give you all of me. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I choose to fight my battle your way. I choose God plus me plus the right people and I receive victory in my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's give him a great, he got the praise today. I believe God's moving.